starting. There we go, and we're live. Yay. Good evening. My name is Patrick Dempsey, and I am the host of tonight's Connected Learning Podcast. You're joining me in lovely eighth grade science land here <laughs> uh, in my classroom, as it is the quietest place tonight. Um, with me tonight, we have the pleasure of interviewing Sarah Perlholm. Sarah is the founder of nonprofit Whatever It Takes, which provides a college level course for high school students where they learn entrepreneur and leadership skills while designing, launching, and growing social impact projects. Uh, so I can't wait to hear about that because that's going to be interesting. But you'll, if you want to learn more, you can, you can learn about Sarah's toolbox of life, life lessons at her. Yeah. Talk. So Sarah, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be part of this, and it's the most interesting location I've ever done an interview with, and yeah. so I'm excited about it. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Um, so tell us about your journey to creating the nonprofit, whatever it takes. Well, the first thing I should say is that I never set out to create a nonprofit. Okay. So I was not, I was just to bring that point home even more. I was a theater major in college. So clearly I was not on a track to be uh, eventually being an entrepreneur and running my own nonprofit. But WIT came to be as a result of being laid off of my second profession, which was uh, teaching. Mm -hmm. And then deciding that maybe it'd be interesting to go back to my first profession, which was television and film and see if I could combine what I learned in the classroom and take it on to a reality show. And so I had this idea and I pitched it and I was told to go back home and get, uh, get it in action. So get some footage. And in the process of getting footage of youth making a difference in their community, uh, mm -hmm. wit was born. So wit started as an elementary school program that was focused on engaging younger kids in social impact projects but then evolved into now being solely a high school project high school nonprofit as a, a nonprofit focused on high schoolers that are making social impact projects and becoming entrepreneurs okay. so it was a that is a you know 30 second wrap wrap of a 5 years of growing yeah. this but it really has been an evolution and really about letting our audience, our customer, our teens drive us and let us know what they need. And so now we found that we've got this great product, the only college credit social entrepreneur program in the country for high schoolers. And now we're on a mission to grow it across the country. Hmm. So now, now I'm curious about the reality TV show. Okay. What was going to yeah. be, what was the reality TV show going to be? So I was really interested in this concept of what has been penned responsible reality shows, understanding that people have a almost insatiable need to watch reality shows, which I wish they realized were not necessarily reality. Not There's really a lot of reality. scripting going right. a lot of a lot of scripting going on in those quote unquote reality shows. But I knew that students were watching a lot of television and I knew they were watching reality shows and everybody kind of has this hunger for their 15 minutes of fame. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to give youth this, these 15 minutes of fame, but in a really positive and productive way. And so I was a, the show concept was a mix between Extreme Home Makeover meets Oprah's Big Give, which used to be on the air. And what we would do, I have... I don't really like I don't really like the extreme home makeover model of just helping one family get a very big house. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it goes deeper than that, but I like the idea of communities coming together and creating and improving spaces that everybody would use. Okay. So we would ask we would ask youth and kids in, in these different cities, what do you need? And the idea would be they would write in and say, our community center is a mess. Our library has been destroyed. Uh, we don't have lights up for the basketball court, so we can't play at night. It doesn't feel safe. And so we would take these ideas, and then all of a sudden we would surprise them in the city and say, mm -hmm. okay, we're here. And now the whole community would come together to do this revamping, of whether it be a community center or a basketball court or something. And then the, what I saw was then the whole community benefits from the hard work that was put into the project. Huh. Uh, and That's so cool. – it would be these wins for the whole community. And in Extreme Home Makeover, you'd see, you'd see hundreds of people come together to support building a mansion. Right. But So I thought, well, why not just have them build 
a community center or uh, improve the park or do something like yeah. that. And so uh, <laughs> it was feel good television. Absolutely. It was yeah. feel good television, yeah. but there was a big concern from the people that were involved that there wasn't going to be enough drama to which I said, you've never been in a classroom then because you don't understand that there's natural. <laughs> that so true. <laughs> you don't have so to true. create drama. So drama there will naturally be drama with youth. Just let them be themselves and things will happen. Yeah. And then we would put that time limit component, which time limits, uh, time limits always add a little bit of stress and anxiety. So they said, go back and get some footage. But that footage actually turned into a nonprofit. And then the television show is still being developed and worked on but I'm actually have another idea of television show that I'm working on so the thing is cool. I have these two worlds that I always play in uh, but they're my passions you know film and television and also helping youth so That's I just neat. like to be in, I like to be in both so started as an elementary yeah. school project why mm -hmm. why elementary I guess is it because that that was your teaching world was elementary yeah, I think I went where I felt comfortable and I was okay. already working. I had already been working on an elementary school and I had friends that were elementary school teachers so I could go back to them and say, any chance I could use your, t use your class as a sample <laughs> demographic? And they'd mm -hmm. say, sure, yeah, you can come in and try it out. Uh, but then what we found was uh, we were running it as an after school program. So we would have, what we did was we would have students join WIT and we would work with them K through fourth grade, K through fifth grade, and we'd have about 20 kids, and they would launch school improvement projects. So murals, uh, school gardens, and then they would, once they did that project, then they'd go out into the community and do a beach cleanup or something. So there was this idea of first helping your own space and then going out into the community and then going out into the world. So a talent yeah. show that would help build a water well in Africa or something like that. Okay. But then what we found out was that the youth market for after school program is pretty saturated. There's a lot sure. of people working with the little ones because they're cute and they're fun. <laughs> and they're cute. there's a more of an interest to work with the little ones. But there wasn't so much this interest to work with high schoolers and work with teenagers. Mm. And I thought, huh, let's try that out. So we took a beta group and just kind of tried out the program with them. And they did some really great work. And we thought, I think there's something here. The teenagers can drive. They can do more work on their own outside of school hours. Yeah. And we just, again, I think, I'm, I think one of my strengths is my ability to surrender when and, and to listen to where the market's driving us. And so instead of going, oh, my gosh, we have to stay with this idea because this is how we started, I said, well, we don't have to. If the market's pulling us a different direction and we actually see that we can – make yeah. more money there we can help more teens there we can fill a need that that's not being filled let's explore that let's be the first in that area and so i think that was it was a natural evolution it really wasn't an arduous like oh my gosh what are we going to do it was really one day deciding we're ending elementary we're solely focusing on high school and we're going to make it the best program out there and then yes. it, that became very exciting to me because I felt like we weren't spread so thin. We weren't doing K through 12 programming and right. running around. I just didn't like that. I felt, I felt we, weren't do, we were doing things well, but we weren't doing them great. And I have a problem with that. I want to do them great. Right. So it was, we ended it. And I don't think there was, you know, there wasn't some traumatic loss in the community. Everybody. Was no, TV? no? Well, that's, no. That's neat. Um, so tell me, tell me about the name, whatever it takes. Where, where does that come from? I came from my classroom motto. My classroom motto was whatever it takes. My first, I should say, uh, cause my first classroom was a trailer. So I was teaching uh, in a trailer, trailer because of, you know, there was not, you know, the, the, the famous trailer classroom. Yeah. And I was teaching fourth grade and I actually love that I'm still in touch with those kids that I taught fourth grade to. I'm still friends with them on Facebook, and they're off doing great things, graduated from high school. Uh, there were some excuses in that classroom. And just not doing homework, not getting things done, and, and no, no, not an apologetic tone around that. Just like, no, I didn't do it. I was very confused by that. I didn't understand that approach to school, having been somebody oh, who didn't have that choice. 
I, uh, I lost not... you there for a second. Tell me, okay. tell us again, um, kids were having excuses. Lots of excuses. And so I thought it was, it really was, it was one night, it was dark outside. I was staying at school late, which as you know, a lot of teachers do. And I just took this butcher, this, this, this long piece of orange butcher paper. Yeah. What you're doing right now yes. and some paint. And I just painted whatever it takes. And I put it up on the wall and above your white, like your whiteboard right there, right above that whiteboard. Yeah. And they came into class and I said, that's how it's going to work in here. Now we do whatever it takes and everything that we do. And that was my goodness, 10 years ago. And then when I was mm. launching a company, I thought, it'd be fun to call it wit kids or wit something. So we started, we called it wit kids in the beginning. And then obviously when I started working with teenagers, they weren't really excited about the idea of being called kids. So sure. we just shortened it to wit. And so they're just, the company's called wit, whatever it takes Inc. And uh, we work with teens and, and our, we ha our hashtag is do wit. We talk about doing wit. I mean, it's a, just a normal, it's our language is living yeah. wit, doing wit, being wit. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's kind of become the language of now your your work with your organization, which is neat. Yeah, I mean, we yeah. I, I just worked on a book this summer, and teenagers are involved in the our wit teens are involved in it, and it's eleven tips for doing wit and living that every day. So I mean, it, it's funny. I, I I obviously travel a lot and. We have sometimes I say we do wit and like what are you talking about? I'm like oh yeah, whatever it takes. It's not that common yet. One day, one day it'll be like common. It's gonna language. be the new <laughs> cool word. It's gonna be the new cool thing to do. Yes, it's the cool thing That's to awesome. do is to do wit. <laughs> That's neat. So how do you know wit is working? Like you, you've been doing it for a little while now. Um, how do you know it's working? How do you know it's hitting what you want it to? Great question. And I think you have to look at that from a lot of different angles. So, you know, is it working in the classroom? Is it working in the community? Is it working as a business? Uh, okay. Is it working as a culture of a, you know, of a staff, as a team? And I think that the answers to all, in those different kind of categories would have different answers. So as a business, yes, we have created something which is sustainable and scalable. And that's very exciting to me as a nonprofit. The fact that we have a revenue stream as an organization, an internal revenue stream with a tuition-based program, which also allows us to receive corporate donations or individual sponsors and things like that, yet we're not reliant on government grants, and we actually it can exist and be sustainable without donations is something that's very exciting to us. Yeah. So for me, it's... Okay, in that area, we, of course, we could do better, and we want to do better, and we want to keep growing it as a business. But that's exciting to me to be able to pay our staff well and to, to make a living doing what I love. Uh, and then I would say, how do we know it's working with our teens? Well, there's a few things. I mean, I'm not going to bore everybody with the different assessments and surveys and things that you can do to make sure that you're hitting your standards and objectives and all those <laughs> academic language. Yeah, so make sure we that we're doing quote, of best practices, all that yeah. good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have uh, those type of academic assessments and surveys in place so that yeah. we can make sure that we're meeting the needs of our teens. Uh, and then I would say the best way to find out if what we're doing is working is just ask the kids. It is just I'm to ask do a little, the teens. Little travel here. Okay. okay. So, I don't mean to make you seasick. No, it's not. <laughs> like we're going on, we're going on an adventure. Right. Uh, so I think that's the big thing is we check in with our teens on a regular basis, and that looks like formally checking in with them, and also pulling them aside and having one-on-one -on -one conversations with them, with the facilitators talking to them, and just saying, "Are we meeting your needs?" And I will tell you that we create such a safe space in wit that our teens will say no. But they also know if they're going to say no, that they should, that they have to have, and here's what I would like to see being done in wit, right? They can't just come and complain because that's annoying. I mean, who wants somebody that just comes and complains right. and whines? But if, if you really feel like there's something that we could do differently, let us know. And that happened uh, last year with one of our teens, Lauren Clark. She kept me after school, after school, after class one day, and we ended up having one of those parking lot conversations for two hours. 
And she said, I just feel like WIT could do a better job bringing together the teens from all the different sites and all the different locations and creating more of a collaboration, collaborative environment with the teens that are in different programs and different classes. Maybe we could even build businesses together. And as I was hearing her talk, of course, as a human being, you have a natural tendency to want to kind of get defensive or be like, well, sure. uh, we're trying. Yeah. But that doesn't work. I mean, when a teen's opening up to you, it's the best advice is just shut up and listen to them. So that's what I did. And, uh, and then I responded to her and I said, well, do you think you could create that which you're asking us to create? And she said, yeah, I think I could. So I said, okay, we'll do it. So over the summer, she actually built out different um, events that would bring the teens together. And we had our first one in September, and it was an adventure race that she coordinated. And it brought the teens from, in San Diego from all the different locations together to work together, almost like an amazing race scavenger hunt through an iconic park in San Diego. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. And she did it. And she had a partner, but she was the one that really spearheaded it and got it done and worked about the permit office and all that kind of stuff. So for me, it's, we're not always doing everything great, but that's fine. But we know who to talk to to make it even better. And we just go to our teens and we check in with the parents too, to make sure the parents are satisfied with the kind of product and the program that we're giving their child. But the teenagers really drive our evolution and our program. We have two of them that sit on the board and I built wit. This version of WIT was built for teens. It's That's what it's for. Mm -hmm. And if it's not serving them, then we have a problem. So um, I just ask, I ask them, yeah. are we giving you, are we doing whatever it takes? Are we doing, are we meeting your needs? And then <laughs> you just have to be ready for the answer. <laughs> right. And, you know, so, I, love, I love that you all have created this culture where, yes, they're, they're safe to, to share their real opinion, but then they also have to be ready to act on on their oh, opinion. Oh yeah, like well, because I'm I'm not going to listen to somebody whining. Like that's right. easy. Right. It's like when people complain about the government, and then you say, "Have you voted?" and they say, "No." It's like, okay, well then. Sure. Never Same mind. thing. Like we're not we're not talking about it anymore because like you don't even do anything about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so. That's. That's awesome. So what, what do you feel like WIT does to create that safe place for kids where they can, they can speak their, not, their mind but also feel empowered to act? Well, I, uh, a couple are, we have 11 tips for living WIT, which it was, we don't have to get into those, but that's kind of creates our culture, those tips and how we live. But also, our, is that what your TED Talk was about? Was that no? Was that, that's no, that, that came after different. my. That okay. came, I came after my TED Talk. Um, okay. No, and then the the other kind of thread that runs through everything that we really don't publicize, although I think we're going to be shifting that because we think that we have something here. Is that our whole thing is that everybody feels loved, valued, and heard, and that drives everything from our work with our staff, the students, the parents, the partners. And that was just a language that I started using kind of behind the scenes, everybody, not out in public, like we say about like doing wit and wit and wit, but just with all, with our whole community was just about, okay, make sure that everything that we're doing is coming from a place of making sure that everyone feels loved, valued, and heard. So when you're launching a project or a business, make sure that your, that your customer, the person that you're going out to serve, make sure that they feel that you are, that you love and that you're valuing them and that you're hearing them. And then mm -hmm. to our staff, training them how to do that with the teens. So it was kind of just this short way of me saying, this is what we have to make sure that we're always doing. Yeah. And I, and, and I then. That. Yeah, that's good. Feeling loved, valued, and heard. Loved, valued, and heard. I think that's. Well, I mean, if we all felt that huge. way, I mean, wouldn't we all walk in the world a lot differently? Yeah. And if we, when we feel loved and then whatever that looks like for you and then valued and then heard, I mean, you just, you feel so good. And then the idea is that, that feeling that you feel inside, I mean, if you can make other people feel that way, wow. I mean, that's amazing. And it's, it's not, I don't do it well every day at all. I mean, trust me, I, yeah. I don't think I always make everybody feel loved, valued and heard, but I try. Sure. And, uh, we, it was interesting, you know, I, it had never really become public language 
until recently at University of Virginia when we had, we were just speaking there and I had two teenagers, two wit teens with me and they were speaking and then they were on a panel and then somebody raised their hand and asked them, well, what do you need from adults to help you be successful? And then one of our students said, well, actually at WIT, we say it's really important to feel loved, valued, and heard. And if more adults could do that, that would be even better. Uh, and she just said it very casually, right? Because that's what she hears all the time. And then yeah. the following day, a, a woman came up to these two girls and said, I need to talk to you about what you said yesterday on the panel. And I said, okay, you know, <laughs> what's up? And the woman said, when you said that you just wanted to feel loved, valued, and heard, I wrote that down and it totally changed. It sh there was a shift in me. And this woman is actually a professor at the university and she said, I realize I have been listening to my students but not hearing them. And I went mm -hmm. back to them and I said, I just want you to know I'm really going to take some time to hear you, not just listen to you. And then she had a personal story about her nephew posting something on Facebook that made her feel like maybe he wasn't in a good mental state. And she, she reached out to him and said, I just want you to know I love you, I value you, I hear you, and I want you around. She said, I, and that was just, and, and she just heard this a few hours before at the conference. And, the, and the, the girls were crying and she was crying and they were hugging it out. And I just thought, I mean, that's just what we're all craving, right? It's just sure. that, love, valued, heard. So in our spaces, in our classrooms, we help our teens feel that way as a result. They feel strong. They feel brave enough to go off and start a business and fail because some of them do, and they have to start something else. They feel uh, safe enough to share an idea, uh, yeah. I, and I think that. And I also really encourage vulnerability among our staff with our teens. So I'm not above my teens. I may be. I may have been on the planet longer, but I'm not above them mm. at all. That's they a, have a lot. I mean, that's a really no good way. point. <laughs> you know, really that's it. Point. I just, I've just been here longer, but that doesn't give me. Um, any power or any reason for them to think that I have all the answers. It's just that I may have some experience and some stories I can share, but I really connect with them in a way of I'm willing to learn from you. And I think that they feel that. And I don't think a lot of adults approach them in that way. And so when an adult does, I feel like they have a tendency to open up and connect with you. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, that's gonna be that's gonna be one of my takeaways from this interview is feeling loved, valued, and heard. I think that's great. <laughs> really good. Like it, you know, just what confidence is a is a kid gonna approach the problems that come across come up in whatever when they do feel loved, valued, and heard? Mm -hmm. um, it makes us be, all walk into the world a little bit stronger. Yeah, yeah feel that a, way. It's a different lens. It's a different and lens I, that you would approach the problems. And I also think it's really important to understand that it's not necessarily somebody else's job to make you feel loved, valued, and heard. We really teach our teens that it's your job to love yourself, value yourself, and hear yourself, like that inner voice. So yeah, it is something that we can do for one another, which is fine, but that's also a lot of pressure to put on the rest of the world to make sure that mm -hmm. they love you, value you, and hear you. Like <laughs> People yeah. have their own stuff going on too. So. But it's important that we want to teach our teens what it means to love yourself in terms of advocacy, uh, standing up for yourself, um, being self-aware, uh, making choices that encourage your best self. Mm -hmm. So we're not in the business of telling a kid, don't drink, don't smoke, don't this. Okay, like, that's fine. I think we all have heard that. What we, we The approach that we like to come from is make everything's a choice that's one of our tips is like it's a choice so everything's a choice and make choices that serve the best version of yourself if getting if you can somehow tell me that getting wasted on friday night is serving the best version of yourself well let's have that conversation yeah. but i don't think it is and since we're always encouraging everybody to live out of that place then it becomes yeah. an interesting conversation because now you're encouraging people to rise. You're not just like, no, 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 no. This is so annoying, especially when you're a teen sure. to have everybody telling you what not to do. <laughs> I hated that. Yeah. Like, I get it. I'm not supposed to do anything that's fun. I get it. <laughs> like, <laughs> but then if somebody had flipped the conversation, it would have been I think, a different approach for me. Sure. Yeah, you're, you're telling them to do something. Go, go be, yeah. like you said, the yeah. best version of yourself, the best 
you that yeah. that you know how to be. Um, Whatever that looks like in that moment too, right? Because sometimes that changes. And I think we want to encourage our teens to also realize that, that there is not a secret recipe for success. There is not the one path that you have to get on that will guarantee you a happy life. I And I think we want them to become people that know how to advocate for themselves, be solution oriented people, which is what entrepreneurs are. I mean, you see a problem, you want to fix it, mm -hmm. but we understand that not every teen is going to go off and launch a business, but they will go off and be a participant in this world. And if we can send them into the world with a greater understanding of self, a greater understanding of the importance of focusing on solutions, not problems, understanding right. that you're never going to be in a situation where you can't do whatever it takes and make it better. I mean, those are traits and skills that will t they'll take into whatever profession they go into, into relationships, into families that they grow or business, businesses that they grow or people that they work with. So we understand that we're trying to teach more of a way of li like a, approaching life, not just making the assumption that everyone's going to go off and be an entrepreneur, which is probably not the case. Right. Right. <laughs> you know? So... <laughs> So you you've really encouraged kids to you empowered them to fail like they they feel oh, yeah. like they're yeah. in a place where they can fail. You've done a lot of risk taking yourself in like switching careers multiple times and being flexible. Um, but failure is going to happen to those those people that take risks. Um, mm -hmm. And in teaching, like you know, in school world, fa failure could be in the form of a lesson that doesn't quite land um, yeah. or a school initiative that isn't working. And in your TED talk, you talk about your approach to failure and the difference between commas and periods. So oh, I, yeah. I love I love the illustration. Um, so tell us yeah. about tell us about that and um, okay. just like how you incorporate that into wit. Well, I can't take credit for the quote, and I wish I could remember the woman that said it, but we can figure that out in, in, okay. in a minute. We all but, steal great ideas, right? But it was, it was never place a period where, where God has placed a comma. Mm -hmm. And in the talk, I said, I know probably some people in the audience have just freaked out because I said the word God, and I was like, mm -hmm. that's fine. Like, you don't have to, like, I believe in God, you don't have to, whatever. But the idea is uh, never place a period where there really could just be a comma. And the comma, as we know, as educators, it symbolizes a breath, like a pause. And I think in life we have to realize that sometimes not everything, everything might not be lining up exactly where we think it should be, but that doesn't mean it won't. And what ends up happening is we put periods, we end things, we freak out, we act like, oh, it's not going to work. We get really frustrated or we end things out of fear because we don't have that faith, that trust that we can just take a pause, take a breath, and maybe see that things are going to line up a little bit differently. I mean, I can't tell you I, how many times, even today, I mean, we're have, we've had some bumps in the road as we've launched in St. Louis, mm -hmm. and I was just having this great meeting with this woman, uh, uh, Laura Gardner, and she, is, she works at SLU in the Youth Entrepreneurship Department. And... She was super helpful and really dedicated to helping us kind of get back on track with our program launch and just kind of some of the things that we're doing in St. Louis. And I told her, you know, I had to allow myself to not freak out into meaning I wanted to freak out when I was seeing that St. Louis was not doing very well. And by that, put a period and just be kind of fight or flight, that mentality of like, I'm done. Like, it's not working. I'm out. We'll just focus on Austin, New York, whatever. But mm -hmm. I, inside of me, I just have, an, which we all have inside of us, we just have to get, like, take the time to tune into it, the idea of just kind of getting more quiet and still and then not making any decisions unless they're coming from a place of uh, abundance. I know that sounds so woo-woo to some people that would be listening to this, but so many people make decisions from fear or sure. lack, and I just, we can't do that because then we miss out. I would have missed out on meeting this woman, and now what we're gonna be doing with SLU, which is gonna be really exciting, I'm, I'm thrilled about it, if I had put the period and I had just cut and run, because I just sure. didn't, things weren't looking exactly how I wanted them to look. Now, sometimes you do have to put a period. We put a period at the end of the sentence when it came to K through five programming for WIT. We mm -hmm. put a period there. But the thing about putting that period there, it was done with a, a sense of ease. It wasn't done with a, oh my gosh, I'm freaking out. Oh my gosh, our program is, no, it was, yeah, that's what the right thing to do is. 
we got to end that. And to not have your ego get in the way to go, oh my gosh, what are people going to say? You right. had to shut down a program. What are they going to think? Which I am human, obviously. And so I do have that train of thought that goes through my head. And then I call myself out on it. I'm like, oh my gosh, first of all, no one cares. Yeah. <laughs> no then again, it's, it's, it's not about me. Like, yeah. You know. It's just like, I mean, anytime you make a decision out of, a, out of that ego place of like, well, what are people going to think? That's when you know you should not make that decision. Right. You know, right. I just. It's, good call. it's that moment of just, I, 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 it happened to me when we were going to launch in Austin. I wanted to launch Austin early this year. Okay. This is funny. I was like, we're going to launch it just like St. Louis. We're just going to take it out. We're going to launch it. And I was meeting with a friend of mine who's also one of our mentors and board members. And she said, maybe there's another way. Maybe you actually take some time to build the runway and lay the foundation in Austin and then take off where often you just kind of take off Sarah and you don't like... You just, which is fine, but there could be another way of doing it. And I said to her, oh my gosh, the only thing in me right now that is keeping me from saying yes to this idea that you have is the fact that I've already shared with people that, I'm, that I said I would launch it in September 2015, and now I have to go back and tell them that I can't. That means we should, exe we should do it your way, 100%. <laughs> Because the only thing that was keeping me oh, yeah. feeling like that need to push was my vanity yeah. and the ego around what are they going to think? And yeah. as a result, Austin has been amazing to us. Uh, they have, we have been, ah, oh, she was so right. She was so right. I needed to take a pause there and just, and do it, do it right. in a slower way. So um, sometimes the period's necessary. I just think it, we just, it's sometimes people, um, I don't know, maybe you hear this. I don't, I don't know how old you are, so I don't know your peer group, but sometimes in my peer group, people might say something like, I can't believe, I always thought I was going to do fill in the blank, mm -hmm. and now I'm not going to. And I go, why not? Why can't you just say it hasn't happened yet? You don't sure. know the end of the story. Like we almost mourn that which hasn't happened or isn't going, because, but we don't even know yet. Right. So what if it's just a comma? Yeah. What if it's just not right now yeah. Um, yeah. and then eventually? And then that just seems to be a, a more joy-filled way to walk in the world to, for me, just to think that anything's yeah. possible. I'm that girl that thinks anything is possible. <laughs> That's good. It's not done yet. You know, it's not done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Everything's, everything's in beta. I'm just going to live there. Yes. Forever. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. you just don't know. I mean, I was thinking that I would never get back involved in television and that was really bumming me out. And then I thought, but what if it just hasn't happened yet? And then we have this new opportunity coming up for a web series, which I'm really excited about. And I thought, see, if I had just been like, no, it's done, it's over, like, that's not going to happen in my life anymore. That would have been such a bummer because now it's coming back in such an authentic way. It's going to involve teens and yeah. it's just so cool. It's just so cool to see how life is really always working for you, not against you if you let it. <laughs> right. I can't wait to see what that, what that's going to turn into with the reality yeah, me TV. Too. <laughs> yeah, me too. That's funny. <laughs> Uh, so, Sarah, how can people learn more about your message and, and the work you're doing? Well, they can visit our website, which is doingwit.org. Uh, we're also on Twitter with the same handle and then on Instagram with the same one. And also, I post a lot on my Instagram and Twitter under Miss underscore Wit. And I love connecting with people. I... It doesn't matter if you're a teenager that's not in our program. I still want to hear from you. I love hearing uh, the teens answer to the question, how could I make your school and community better for you? I love hearing yes. what they have to say to that. Yeah. And, uh, um, and I like to crowdsource ideas. Like I'm working on another TED Talk and – I'm going to the teens because I found out there's going to be 1,100 teens or 900 teens in the room. And I was like, oh, geez, tough crowd, tough crowd. So I better go to the teens and ask them what do they want to hear me talk about. So yeah. I'm kind of crowdsourcing some ideas for that talk. So, I mean, if, any, if they want to find us that way, um, that's a great way to find us. And, um, yeah, I just and, – and other educators that are out there that are also doing what their form of whatever it takes in the classroom, I love hearing from them. I mean, teachers, we 
have such a, a huge responsibility and some of us really take that responsibility seriously and take that charge um, really seriously. And I think that they, those teachers deserve to get recognized and valued, those that are standing out and doing whatever it takes. Awesome. Um, and how do people get a hold of you if they have any further questions? Uh, you can also email us. I mean, you can email me directly with Sarah with an H at doingwit.org. Okay. Uh, you can also send general emails to info at doingwit.org, but I'm happy to get emails from everybody. That is, that is putting yourself out there. That's awesome. <laughs> um, well, Sarah, thank you so much. I know, like, just as a as a teacher that is currently leading my students through a project where I am trying to empower them to take action in their school community or homes, like it's just it's refreshing to hear. So thanks for thanks for talking with us tonight. Oh, absolutely, and thanks for having me. And I'm kind of jealous that you have a classroom. I miss the classroom. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're kind of jealous of pop in there. panels right now and these fluorescent lights that are going on. I mean, it, it's just that. a weird thing that it takes me back, right? I'm like, yeah, oh, sure. Sure. weird lighting. And yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, I wouldn't be anywhere else right now. This is, it's a good place. You're right. Um, but yeah, thanks again. And um, on behalf of Connected Learning, thank you for joining us tonight, those of you who are watching. And we'll see you next time.